Hello friends of .NET, I'm Omar Landrock and you can find me on Twitter at TerraJobs. In today's episode we are finally tackling the thing everybody was looking forward to, which is actually emitting IL. Um, I will probably do a few episodes on this because I don't think we can finish an entire language uh, for IL today. Uh, because there's also some groundwork that we have to do, because emitting IL is only part of it. In order for us to really iterate, we also have to kind of build our project in a sensible way, right? Because the compiler needs to get a bunch of inputs, right? Of course, of course, the source files, but also, you know, what references do we want to compile against? You know, where is MSCallib, for example? Where is our system.console.writeline? And so in order for us to make that simpler, we kind of want to have an MS build project file as well. So today I want to kind of lay the foundation where we will start with emitting hello world so we get a sense for what IL is actually like. Um, I will probably cheat a little bit and I will start with .NET framework and I will explain why that's cheating, or why that's simpler for us. And then uh, we will turn uh, and make this for .NET, uh, then we will compile this for .NET Core because .NET Core is kind of uh, a little bit more, um, I guess, complicated compared to .NET framework. Um, and then uh, I will also explain why that is and what you would have to do to do that. Um, yeah, I think this is uh, going to be a fun episode, so hopefully you'll ask a bunch of questions. Uh, we can also cover some Q&A at the end or in the middle, so if you have some questions, please put them in the chat and I will try really hard <laughs> to pay attention to the, um, you know, to the overall thing and then we will hopefully have some, you know, a bunch of fun. All right, so then let's just jump right into the coding. All right, let's start with pull requests like we usually do. So we get our hands dirty. Um, yeah, so we'll skip the single line comments for the same reason I skip the other ones because they're way too hard for today. So update error message for usage of msc.exe. Oh yes, we renamed the X, but we did not rename the usage. <laughs> As that always is. Dun, 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 dun. Let's watch this. I am excited for today. This is something that I was looking forward to for quite a while. Um, so what happened here? Interesting, I need more context here. Where are we? So we are in bind return statement. We're saying a function is null. So if it is a script file, then we say, uh, if we don't have an expression, we just return without a value. If we have an expression, then we basically just validate that. Uh, yeah, so exactly, so if we don't have a function, and we are not in a script, it means we are in a global statement that will be lowered into a main function. And so right now I'm doing function.name, which will not work uh, because that will crash. So instead we're calling this new function here, and then we have a custom error message for that. That seems reasonable. And then we are done with that. Sweet. Thanks, Lucas. All right, so now let me pull down the stuff. Oh, some coffee. <laughs> yes, teasing emitting IL since October 2nd, 2018. Hmm. One and a half years later. All right, so let's do something. Let's first create a hello world. Don't need new console. Hello. Uh, let's go to hello. Uh, let's Build hello. All right. That is uh, disappointing. Does this at least work? 
Yes. All right, so I have IELTS Spy installed on my system. IELTS Spy, in case you have never used it, is a decompiler. Um, and there's also a command line version, IELTS Spy CMD, I believe, which is, I believe, a .NET Global tool. Um, actually, I don't have to believe it. Well, let's just see what I've done here. Um, Something is not working with my less, but hey, more works. So where is it? Dun -dun 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 -dun. Yeah. Yeah, I'll spy CMD. I think it's a .NET global tool. Let me actually check, but I'm pretty sure it is .NET tool list. Uh, it is. I'll spy CMD. So I use that because if you're on a Mac, you can't install the, the GUI app because the GUI app is uh, for Windows only. But uh, generally speaking, I like command line anyway. So basically all it does, it runs the command line tool, grabs the IL, and then renders it to the screen, right? So Quite nice. So if you have never looked at IL, this is basically what IL looks like. So it's a it's an actual language, so it has source representation as well, which looks like this. Um, and if you've ever done any sort of assembly language or assembly language, they tend to be fairly low level, not optimized for syntactic sugar at all. But you know, assembly languages usually have a text representation so that humans can at least read it, right? So the same for uh, IL as well. And so the way it looks like is kind of similar to C Sharp in the sense that you have um, curly braces that indicate types, and then within them you have curly braces for the methods. So in that sense, kind of tree-ish, right? But when you look at the actual language, um, it's a little bit more, um, let's say, verbose, right? So here's a bunch of flags that are in the metadata, right? And then you know everything is always fully qualified. There are no usings in IL. Um, and then here's the actual method body for uh, console.write line. So what you see here is that in the method body we have things like max stack and entry point. Um, entry point basically just says this is the main method. Um, and max stack says, you know, how deep is the stack? What's interesting for IL is that IL doesn't use registers, right? So the way IL works is it's called it's called a virtual machine. Um, it's virtual because it's not an actual CPU you can buy. It's a it's a virtual CPU, if you will, right? And then the instructions that you have here are um, stack-based. So for example, this thing here says, take the string literal here and load it on the evaluation stack. Then it says, you know, call this method. So this method here takes an argument. And the way the argument is passed in, it's basically just whatever the current value is at the top of the stack. So when you call this method, it will pop this value off the stack, pass it to this method. And if the method has a return value, which in this case it does not because it's void, but if it would have a return value, it would push the return value onto the stack. And then we basically just say, okay, now we return. Um, so in C-sharp, similar to all language, we have expression statements. So if this thing would have returned a value, then you would have seen sort of a knob here. A knob is just, you know, I think part of the, debug, uh, part of the debugging stuff. Um, but like the idea is that if there is a return value here, it would have popped the return value off of pop and then returned because you have to make the stack balance before you can return. And this is it. And all the, all the stuff you have here are labels, um, which are basically just the instruction offsets in bytes. Uh, that's how they are named. Uh, but there could be any name realistically here. And if you have loops or other stuff, you just have go-to statements exactly like our language. So that's, that's kind of pretty standard. And then uh, here's our constructor, right? Uh, our program class has a default constructor. Um, and that all it does is it, it just loads arc zero, which is the this pointer, and then it calls the instance base constructor, and then it returns. Right. So again, you don't see the stuff in in in, I, uh, in C sharp because there's syntax sugar for that. But the way constructors work, they're a chain. Right. So same thing here. So that is kind of what we want to emit today. So now let me jump back to my P drive. Um, uh, let me pull what we just had. In case I haven't done that already, I've done that. Cool. Um, 
Let's clean, let's rebuild, make sure everything is still building. Probably should get a secondary machine for streaming because my CPU is busy just streaming. <laughs> which definitely makes test execution slower. All right, so now what I want to do is, uh, where are we right now? So I want to go to SRC, um, Minsk. And what I want to do is I want to add a package here. And the package is mono.cecil. Uh, mono.cecil is a library that allows you to read .NET metadata and also emit .NET metadata. And that's what we will use to emit IO. Um, we also have this thing called system.reflection.metadata, but that's a fairly low level API. And um, for us right now, it's much easier if we would um, just use a library to do that, because why would we have such a low level thing to make our lives harder? So let's build this. Actually, we probably did a restore. So what's happening here? Let's just try reload and see what happens. When in doubt, reload. All right, so that seems uh, reasonable. So all right, so now what we need to do is we need to have a backend. So right now we only have this one here. So let's add a new folder. Um, actually let's add a new file. Let's call this emit, uh, emit.cs. Uh, I guess emitter.cs. Um, and then let's cheat because I'm horrible at typing. Uh, do, 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 do. And that would be emit. Probably one using system eventually. And then we say internal static class emitter. All right, good enough for now. Now what we want to do is you want to actually uh, think about what we want to actually do here. So we have. A Actually, let's start differently. Let's start right from the compiler itself. So the compiler here takes a bunch of arguments, in our case, a bunch of source paths. And then currently what we do is we just create our compilation and we evaluate it, right? So that's not what we want. What we want to do now is instead of doing that, we want to do compilation uh, emit, no, not emit tree, we say emit, which is basically writing everything to disk. And um, so what we want to pass here is probably the stream where the, uh, you know, where the binary is being written to. Um, so there's a few things you probably want to do. Let's start with uh, one of the key things here. So one of the key things we need to pass in if we create a script is uh, the name of the module. So string module name. which is basically the name of the assembly and the name of the module. Um, and I think the other thing we want to pass in here um, is a bunch of references. Um, do we want to do that? No, I don't think we want to do this quite yet. How about we, eh, well, let's do references. It is simpler, or is it? Basically, what I'm debating here is whether we pass in a single reference to MS call or whether we pass in a bunch of references. Um, let's do a bunch of references. Uh, 
And then I guess for this guy here, same thing, we have to pass these guys here. So let's indent all of the stuff here, uh, line. And then same here. And then same here. So for script, I think we omit the module name for now. I just call it script. Um, you know what? Let's make our lives easier. Let's not complicate the design quite yet. Let's just add a method. Create method emit. Yep, let's do that. Um, and let's take all the arguments here, because why not? This way we have it localized. So what we need is the module name, string, module name. We need a bunch of references and we need an output path, right? That's probably the easiest way to think about this for now. Um, and then basically what I will do is I will say, um, so we need the program, var program, is get program. And then we can say emitter, Emit the program with this module name, with these references in this location. Fair enough. Um, what we don't have right now is if we start with the compiler again, we need to forward that information. So let's do another thing here. Let's go to our compiler project. And let's add another package, .NET add package uh, mono.options, which is what we use for command line parsing. Ooh, episode 18 branch. Yes, 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 yes. Good, 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 good. Git checkout be episode 18. Thank you for that. That was, that was helpful. Um, I probably have to reload this window now because I installed the package. All right, so now we have this. And what we will do here is we would say, um, somewhere here, uh -huh. auto complete for the win. If you never used mono options, it's actually quite nice. Options equals new option set, something like that, right? Um, what is happening? Here we go. I was just too fast to only sharp. Using mono options. Um, so the way this works is you can uh, you can pass in a bunch of stuff here. So for example, we can say we want to have um, an option called R, which takes a value, um, and then we say the description is something like uh, um, the path of an assembly to a reference. And then the action is var references, references equals new list of string. And then we say references add v. And then uh, we will probably take something like O, the output path of the assembly to create. And then we say var output path is 
string null. And let me just say this guy equals v. Um, and then I think the syntax is like this for everything that is not matched. Um, it's a source path. Source path. And then we call this reference paths. Um, and then we can say v uh, source paths at v, something like that. Um, and we probably want the obligatory help, help, I guess it's what, question mark, help, and we call this var help requested false. Uh, something like that. And then we can say if help requested uh, options. Um, what is that help? Is that the one? Something like this. Uh, I think something like this, right? All right, so now we have our paths, which in our case, we would say, so what git file paths does, I believe, is basically expanding directories. and sorts them. So in our case, the file paths would be source paths. Then we load them all. We validate that they actually exist. Um, yeah, we have to determine what the name of the module name now is. So the module name, we want to have it optional. Yeah, here's another fun one. If you want to have generic help string, you add it here. Model options is an interesting library. It's kind of weird in many ways, but it's also fabulous in many ways. Um, so probably what we have to say is, let's remove this guy here. And let's do this here and say if paths uh, count, what does this guy return in enumerable? Yeah, okay, fine. Two array then. Uh, length is zero. Then we say console out error, no, console, console out error. Hmm. Console error, right line. Uh, bum, bum, error need at least one source file, return one. Then we can say if output path is null, then we will take uh, uh, the source path, one of the first ones we got, source path zero, and we just say we use that as the output name except we change the extension. So we say path dot change extension, this guy to dot DLL. Is it X here or is it DLL? Well, we will find out later. Um, but on framework it's X for now, so that's, that's fine. So we'll cheat this way and then we have our syntax tree, we load them all, but they, they exist, when they have arrows, we return. So now I should be able to say, uh, 
uh, fine, let's do var string. Uh, module name is path get file name. Get file name without extension output path. Um, does CSC have that? I don't even have it in my path. No, that's sad. Uh, developer command prompt. I think CSC takes the module name. Yeah, module name. All right, fine. Um, uh, let's call this M. Uh, the name of the module and then we do the same thing here we say module name something like this right um module name if module name if module name is no then we set it like that finally we can assign the module name we can as we can pass in the references reference paths wait Boom, 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 reference paths, 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 paths. It's hard to say path, apparently. Output path is output path, right? Yes. Um, boom, 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 boom. Yeah, so emit probably needs to return errors as well, because you can have errors that are only occurring in the emit phase. Um, so let's call this result as well. And so if results for any diagnostics, we print them. No, sorry, then if we have any diagnostics. Okay, let's be lazy. Yes, we don't return anything right now, that's fine. But the only thing we want to validate as well is that the... Um, uh, that the files actually exist. Um, so let's do that. Let's say this is in reference path. And then probably we need the two array here. And then the only other thing we need, I think here, is we need to say this is emit result. Um, which similar to our evaluation result will be emit result. Um, For now, it's just diagnostics. You know? If program diagnostics any, then return program diagnostics. No. No. Let's do this here.
Sometimes you change your mind like five times. Uh, let's remove this guy here because that is slightly over engineered for now. Yep. So what's your problem now? Reference paths is okay. So if is it if yes yes, let's call this diagnostics. Um, reference path. How did I name it? Reference path. Jesus. All right. So far, so good. Now we have done a bunch of stuff and all we do is we just forward a bunch of arguments. Yeah, Lucas is asking when I have an output stream instead of a path. Well, we could, we probably should. Um, yeah, but one problem at a time. Let's prettify the API at a later stage. For now, it's just, um, yeah, simple. All right, so how do we start here? Well, with CC, uh, sorry, with Cecil, not CCI. Gee, CCI is the other library that we use to emit metadata. But with uh, Cecil, it's quite simply, you just say var assembly definition equals new assembly, assembly definition. I don't think I can do that. I probably have to do this, right? Create, create assembly. So there's basically two methods here. Create and read. Read, you just read an assembly from disk. That's what we use for the references. And create assembly is, uh, we create an assembly that we need. So what does it need? Well, it needs uh, an assembly name definition, a module name and a module kind. Okay, so let's start with the assembly name is assembly definition, create assembly. No, what? Assembly name definition. Assembly name definition, um, which we can probably create. Um, it needs a string name, which in our case we use the module name, uh, and the version number. So we use version 1.0 because that seems reasonable. Then we can pass in the assembly name. Now we need a module name, which we have, and module kind, module kind which in our case is going to be console. And then basically what we have to do here is assembly definition, write, and then we say file name and that's our output path. Uh, so first we say, if program diagnostics any uh, then we say return program diagnostics otherwise we say return um, another immutable array of diagnostic dot empty right something like that All right, now let's go to our compiler, source, source, MSC, what, no, CD, MSC. I'm really not good at typing today. CD, MSC, and then we can say .NET run. Hopefully this will work. Okay, this has worked fantastically. Okay, so this is clearly not working. So what is the problem? I suspect the problem is I need to do these guys here.
Okay, now I have messed up. I need a comma here, no comma there. <laughs> Do you need to parse the options into the, uh, yes, you need to parse the options. Options.parse uh, arcs. Thank you, this would have been useful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, help does not exist. Fine. Okay. Now, now I think it works like this, right? I think. Let's see. I'm hopeful. Not a fan of system or command line. Um, I haven't used it much, to be honest. Like I've, for some reason, at some point I started using options because Miguel was raving about it. Uh, and then uh, I kind of like it, I have to say. It's very weird and I mean, again, the API is virtually undiscoverable because everything is string based, but I mean, come on, this is 10 lines of code. I mean, hard to beat. Anyway, so we have, here's our help. Now we have, we can see, we can pass source path, we can pass options. Uh, one of the options is the reference, the, one of the options is the output path, one of the options is the module name. Um, okay, maybe we should also say prints help. Um, so now let's see what happens when we say source file is uh, samples. Hello. Yeah, I guess we can just pass in hello, right? Hello, and then we say nothing, I guess. So here's the real question, where did it write the thing now? So I think Let's actually open another terminal here. So we don't have to keep switching back and forth between our compiler and our sample folder. Uh, this is Minsk samples, hello. Let's zoom in a little bit as well. Um, what do we have here? Hmm. Hmm. Maybe, maybe we should just say here, um, console dot right line output path. I mean, good compilers don't do that, but <laughs> we're nowhere near a good compiler. So sample hello XE, I see, so I put it here. That is very weird, but okay, I take it. So if I say il hello.exe, does it actually work? It does. Congratulations, we just wrote an empty module to disk. I think this is uh, already worth celebrating, like uh, in a weird way. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so of course we have to do slightly more than that. So. But we get the idea. I think the first question is why did it write it there? So we said we didn't specify an output path. So we used uh, the first source path, right? So if output path is none, we basically change the extension of source path zero to XE. Ah, yeah. That's right. So we basically have to parse this the other way. We have to say var directory is, yeah, I guess in our case, it's kind of a little bit convoluted because we do this directory expansion. You know what? Let's make our lives easier for now. And let's just take all of this stuff here and put it in here because quite frankly, who needs hello world to be more than one file? Uh, not this one, the other one would be more helpful. 
Yes, yes, yes. And then we call this hello. And then we delete this. Yeah, yeah, do your thing. And then in order for us to not be completely insane, um, let's simplify this even further to just hello world. Okay, so now what we should be able to do is Do that. All right. Now we can. Now we can stop printing our thingy. In fact, we should also get rid of this whole file path extension thing, probably. Yeah, because we will delete that. Yes. The, the only reason we did this was so that when we edit this file here. Sorry, if we edit this file here. And we can just have a shortcut that effectively invokes the compiler. But we replace this with a proper MS build solution anyway, so we don't have to do these crazy extensions. So now we can say paths is oops, source paths, which now means let's just inline this guy, which now means count. Should still work. And if we go to hello. Okay, we still have our hello XE in there. Okay, cool. So halfway there. Now let's actually um, think about what we have to do. So we have to emit the following, right? So what we want to emit logically is something like class program. Well, I guess in our case, we want to say static class program. We want to have a public, not even, a void main. And what we want to have here is system.console.writeline hello world, right? So logically, that's the C-sharp that we want to emit. Uh, and the way we do this is we start with a type definition. So we say type definition is new type definition. Um, what's the namespace? Well, we don't have one because we put everything in the root. The name, of, the name of the type is going to be program. And then the type attributes are type attributes. Um, it's going to be static, which in IL is abstract sealed, which sounds a bit odd, but that's how sealed works. Uh, that's how static works. Because um, abstract basically means cannot instantiate, and uh, 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 sealed means can't, in, can't, in, can't inherit, right? So there is that. And then what is the other thing? Type attributes public. Uh, I think this is, yeah, we don't mark it public, so this should be it. And then we have to say assembly definition types, uh, sorry, modules. Where does this thing go? Uh, oh yeah, main module types dot add type definition. Now let's add the method var main is new method definition uh, main method attributes is a uh, few things. It is a static function. And this is pretty much it. So what is the return type? So of course that is the void type, right? 
But how do we say this? Well, we have to import the, the, the type. So one thing we have to do now, actually, let's start with this. Let's just do this and then convince ourselves that that still works. And then I can say IL hello. And funny enough, nothing happened. That is weird. What? Now I'm slightly confused. Hello, Don Axie. Let me check whether it's just a problem with the. Um, with the output. No, oh, we seem to not have emitted the type. Oh, no, actually, yeah, we, we run .NET run here, right? So it would have picked up our changes. Uh, yes, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> it helps to write it after the fact, not before the fact. Okay. <laughs> In the realm of uh, particularly smart. All right, cool. Now we have that, and now when we do this, actually, if you do this, yay, we have our type. Congratulations. Uh, and now if you look here, we have our program thing and it's empty. Okay, nice, nice, nice. So now in order for us to import this thing, we have to open this guy here. So we basically say for, each, for every reference, we open the reference, um, which, yeah, I guess uh, easiest way to do this is to say, uh, Is a mutable array of diagnostic, actually no, uh, new diagnostic bag. And then we say result to a mutable array. Um, is that how I do it? We don't have a method for this. No, no, okay, fair enough, fair enough. Two immutable, all right. And then we can basically say for each var uh, reference in references, assembly definition, Assembly name definition, is it name definition? No, it's assembly definition. Uh, read assembly uh, reference var assembly. Um, and then we say var uh, assembly, so it's new list of assembly definition. Add assembly, and then we say try. I'm not entirely sure which exception is coming up here, so eh. let's handle this later, um, and then actually see what actually ends up having in the crash. So basically, when this is an invalid metadata, this guy will throw. So then we will handle this reported diagnostic and move on, and then if there are any diagnostics here, if result any return result to immutable. We don't want to move ahead, right? So let's try this first. So what do we pass in as the reference, right? In our case, we will, again, we will cheat for now. Reference assemblies, Microsoft, Framework, what is it? 
uh, .NET Framework, because we will start with .NET Framework, 472 MS call it, right? So let's, let's pass this as the reference. Um, so this would be this guy. Did I not copy the path? So this should still work. And this should blow up. Bad image format. Okay, so that's cool. Then that's the exception we are looking for. We will say bad image format exception. Then we will say uh, diagnostic uh, result um, report invalid reference um, and we pass in the reference path all the way here and then we say public void uh, path um, and then we say something like that. Um, um, the, the reference is not a valid .NET uh, assembly. Hmm, we don't have a location. That might be a problem. Let's just default this right now. Which probably means uh, <laughs> at the point where we emit the diagnostics, we probably have to handle that. So write diagnostics. So. If diagnostics, if diagnostic dot location, diagnostic dot location equals default. What I can't do that. Fine, be like that. Um, let's say file name is null. Then we just do this. Else we do all the other stuff. Reference exception, text location get file name. Let's pull in the sorting, right? <laughs> yeah, this is not going to work very well, is it? Um, Let's do this. Let's cheat entirely here. Let's say uh, 
where the the location um, text is not now. This one hopefully throws. Yes, yeah, so this is all fine. Um, and then we just do for each var diagnostic in diagnostics where d dot uh, location dot text is null. Not ideal. I think in the long run, what we probably want to do is we want to change our location to basically reference both source locations as well as non-source locations. Nice. So at least no longer crash. We report an uh, appropriate error message. That is nice. Now let's go back to the emitter and we want to actually resolve our types. So yeah, what are we going to do here? So. Yeah, one of the first things we need to do here is resolve types. So which types do we need? Well, we have, of course, our built-in types. Uh, there is uh, any, which binds to object. There is uh, int, which binds to system.int32, right? So let's do this, system.object. Uh, and then we have, uh, what is it, any int... Uh, string which binds to system.string and then we have the other one which is uh, void which is system.void and I think we also have bool, right? bool is system.bool uh, so the first thing we want to do is we want to find all these types and if we can't find them, we report an error for each of them that we can't find. Um, what is the easiest way of doing this? Well, uh, built in types is new list of, um, let's make it a tuple of um, string type name. I guess uh, type symbol um, type and um, string uh, meta data name, right? And so what we will do is we say there is type symbol dot any and that maps to system.object, right? And let me repeat this for the other one. So we have bool, uh, we have int, we have string, and we have void. And I think that's them all, right? Any bool in string void, yes. Error we don't have to do. And then we say bool is system.bool, boolean, I think, is it? System dot, yeah, it's boolean. Uh, int is in 32, of course. Uh, string is string. And then void is void. So add tuple name type. Wait. Oh, because I have to. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> For a second, I forgot how to write C sharp code. <laughs> All right, so now we have that. Now we will say for each var, um, what is this? Um, type metadata name, metadata name in built in types. Uh, we are saying uh, for each var assembly, I guess now, 
var type definition equals uh, assemblies select many a uh, what is this types uh, main module yeah I guess we probably need to do modules so the way .NET also works, which is also a very rarely known thing, is that there's such a thing as called multi-module assemblies, which is basically an assembly that exists in multiple files. That is fairly rare, but it is a thing. So we, from each assembly, we get all the modules. And then from them, we say, uh, for each of them, we say select many. Uh, and then module, we say types. And then we say where, I guess single, yeah. Yeah, single, eh, single is possibly, uh, eh, we say where t, t full name equals metadata name. And then we say to array. Type definition, right? I guess that's a bad idea here. Um, uh, 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 type different uh, found types. Screw it. So now there's multiple cases, right? One case is if found types uh, length is zero, then we can say diagnostics, uh, no result, uh, report, uh, missing, built in type and then we say type right else if found types uh, length bigger than zero uh, bigger than one I guess then we say um, uh, I guess you should say built-in type not found and then we say built in type built in type ambiguous and then we pass in the type and the found types and then also we build a dictionary of like uh, known types is a new dictionary that gives us uh, given the type symbol, it gives us back uh, a type reference. So here's the other thing. So now we found the type definition. But the type definition um, that's the other way around. Let's say if found types length is one else else um, then we can say uh, var type reference we say now in our assembly that we just created which we now do beforehand we have to say import. So we say import hmm. I guess it's on the main module, right? Import, import reference. Uh, I'm saying import or import reference. Right? That's one of those things that I think it's import reference. Um, import reference for our found types zero, right? So basically the way metadata works is that metadata is a database, right? And so I now found the definition in the other assembly, but in order for me to reference that definition in the other assembly, I have to import that type first into my own assembly. Basically you create a foreign key entry, if you will. And this is what import reference does. And now I can just say uh, known types, add type, uh, type reference, right? And let's call this type symbol here to just avoid 
confusion. And then this should almost get us there. So now let's add these two guys here just for good measure. Do, 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 do. And then I think it's time for me to read some questions again. Um, public, public, public. Badum, 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 badum. Um, built in type not found. Uh, the built in type cannot be resolved among the given references. Um, and that would be type symbol. Built-in type I was found in multiple references, and let me say uh, yeah. Let's call this assemblies, assembly names. There will be found types. Um, uh, select now we need link probably um, what is it T um, contain hmm how do we get from the thing up to the type again I guess module, right? Module assembly name, name, and I think that is the actual string, right? Yes. All right. And then we say var assembly name list is string dot join with a comma or assembly names. And what's wrong with assembly? Oh, fair enough. It's always good to type check. Um, in this case, spell check. Um, and apparently I still can't do it. Uh, assembly, here we go. Yay, so does this compile? Cecil has a type system class that you can access to main module type system, but that exposes the built-in types, but I think it may require you to have a valid assembly resolver. Yeah, probably. The built-in type int cannot be resolved among the given references. The built-in type int cannot be resolved among the... Why do we get this twice? cannot be resolved among the given references. Okay, so... Oh yeah. It helps to actually have the right time name. Aha, so okay, we didn't fail to compile. That is, that is, uh, we made some forward progress. Now let's do the following. Now, let, now we have the void type. And we can say void type equals uh, known types, type symbol void. Right, and now we can say this is of type void. Um, and then we can say type definition 
methods add main let's call this main method uh, and also let's mark this as the entry point. So I think this is on the assembly definition. Entry point is main method. Let's see what happens now. Okay, we did something. Now let's see what we actually got. Here we go. We emitted our class private auto NC abstract sealed program with a method called private scope with a name called main which is weird but here we go CLL managed and then this is it hmm I'm not sure where the name comes from what happened to the name uh, also maybe that's the flex here um, Probably want to mark it private, I guess. What else do we have? Uh, um, bum, 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 bum. Yeah, I think private is. Yeah, so now we actually have the right thing. I think when I omitted uh, when I omitted the visibility private, it defaulted to some weird thing, which means it's uh, getting special treatment, which we don't want. So here we go. Now we have a regular main method with a regular thing, and that is all good. Of course, we have not emitted any code yet, right? So right now, this is not even legal because we have a, an empty method body which is not actually legal in IL because you of course have to return eventually, right? So like the mi most minimum you can do is open brace, red, close brace. Um, so now I think it's time to emit some IL. So how about we do this? How about we say, um, we need an IL builder, I think. IL builder is main method body get IL processor, fine, be like that, IL processor. And then here we can say emit, and now we can say an opcode. Uh, let's start with opcodes. Is it opcodes? No, it's not opcodes. It is, this guy is opcodes, opcodes, red. They should already add our opcode. Here we go. Now we actually have a method body. Uh, max stack eight, entry point, right? As I said earlier, that's the other thing we said. And then we have a return statement. Yay, so now we can actually already run this program, I think. Or not. Cannot load type program from assembly hello because the parent does not exist. Ah, yeah, that's the other thing. So we can, there's only one type in the system that's allowed to have no type it derives from, and that is object, right? So the very minimum we have to say type definition, uh, what is that, base type? Yeah, base type, and that is known types, type symbol any right because that is our let's call this object type so let's try this again
now we run this, and we just wrote our first program. So it's amazing. So we now have a program that does nothing. It's a very long way to do nothing, but at least it's a legal program, right? And it runs, it's an XE, it's all good. Um, all right, let's remove this one for now. So next thing we need to do is uh, emit our call to console.writeline. So how do we do that? Well, same as before, we would say we need to find um, our type, so which is now going to ourselves a little bit, unfortunately. Probably we shouldn't have done type symbol here because that makes our lives harder. Um, <laughs> how do I reuse this? Well, let's cheat for now. Let's, let's start with the same thing. Let's basically say we need to... Um, yeah, let's do it differently. Let's call this report required type not found. And let's pass in something like simple. Uh, let's just say type name. Um, Minsk name, and then we say string uh, uh, meta data name. So, and then we say var name is Minsk name. Metadata name. Ah. We say if the Minsk name is null, otherwise, uh, the required type metadata name. Uh, the required type Something like that, right? And let me say this is report required type ambiguous. And then we say the same thing, string Minsk name. Say var metadata name is phone types first G full name. What's your problem here? Uh, not select many, select first. Uh, you know what? Fighting link. Because we can. Full name. Uh, here we go. So, metadata name. Um, and then we say this would be this guy here. That would be uh, Minsk name.
Just for pretty error messages, aren't we working a little bit hard here? But yes, the answer is we are working a little bit hard here, but good error messages are important. Yeah, yeah, no semicolon. All right, so this is fine now, I think. Now we have to work slightly harder. Uh, type symbol name. Uh, and then we say this is metadata name, right? And then this is type symbol not name. And this is metadata name. Uh, no, this is, uh, what is this? Found types, sorry, found types. Yeah, I think probably for simplicity and symmetry, we should probably do that. In which case we can get rid of this. Oopsie. Um, all right, so now we have that. Now I can also say I need to resolve. Yeah, so let's do this. Let's call this. Yeah, I probably want to extract this into a function somehow. So the question is, how do we do this? Um, like this var minsk name is type symbol name, right? And then we can say doom doom. like that and then we say type reference type reference something like that right uh, extract method and we call this who um, Yeah, I think we make our lives unnecessarily hard right now. You know what? Let's not make our lives harder than it needs to be. So how about we just copy and paste some code for now? Um, because or revolutionary idea we do this, but diagnostic back, we call this diagnostics, diagnostics, which is new diagnostic back. Make this guy actually instance method. Um, uh, what else do we need to know? We need to know these, uh, the references, so private read only um, let's say list assembly definition uh, yeah let's call this assemblies for now assemblies is new this guy then we also need private read only dictionary from uh, type symbol to type reference. Uh, we call this uh, known types. And then there's a few other ones uh, which we call type reference. Console type. Mm. Is that what I want? 
You know what? Screw it. Let's start simple. Let's just start really, really simple. And let's just copy and paste some code. So console type is this. I want to see some results now. Sometimes when I'm fumbling too much, I just resolve to just hacking it together and then just see where we land. Um, uh, single in our case is system.console. Um, and then var console type reference equals um, what did we say? Assembly definition import console type. Yeah, I think thinking about it now, actually, I think I know what the abstraction is. We want a function that gives us a type reference resolve uh, type and we pass in the string full name and then we do basically this um, metadata name Then we say return type reference. Not it. Not it. Or you say string Minsk Jesus. <laughs> Typing is hard, as it turns out. All right, so we do that. Then we can replace this here with with this. So type reference is now resolve type for type symbol name for metadata name. Otherwise, we say return not. Right, and now we can say resolve type not system.console. Um, next thing we do is uh, we do have a method resolver. So we said uh, similar to how we have type references, you also have method reference. So we say resolve method. Um, and now we say we need to have a type reference. Um, no, actually we need a type definition. We need a type definition. Uh, maybe not. Let's see, string name and then type uh, eh, string type names, uh, parameter type names, uh, parameter, parameter type names. So now the question is, can I go from here to the definition? Is that a thing? Because that will be very, doesn't seem like it, type Sorry, there's something fundamentally wrong here with this guy. What is happening here? Okay. Yeah, so this is now the problem with console. Dot. So apparently our abstraction here is not that great. Uh, let's start with definition. Resolve type 
definition type definition and now we can say what was that again uh, assembly uh, assembly definition main module import reference type definition type reference something like that okay Type definition. Yeah, so again, I think I made my life unnecessarily hard here, but let's ignore this for now. So let's do this simpler. Let's say string type name, and then we just say. Uh, Yeah, I think this is how we will do this. I think I had it right before. So here's what I want. I want this to be just about type references. Then we will do this here, which is basically resolve type. Okay, extract local function. Um, and this is going to be we call this resolve type definition. Nah, actually, I don't like that either. Because <laughs> now I have to deal with multiple return values in the other one. How do we do this in elegant fashion? Yeah. Let's do this for now. So let's do all of this part here. Let's move this down here. And then we say, okay, found types. If found types equal to one, then So if there are multiple found, then we say this is quiet type not found, type name, right? Otherwise we do this. Now we search for the method. Now we say var found type equals this. And now we just for each over the methods. For each, uh, I should say var method equals um, bum, 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 font type, uh, font type method. What's happening here? Font types. Oh, I see it. This doesn't have a. Now we should get intelligence here. Yeah, so now we say methods um, single, I guess where as well, because we can, in the IL you can overload by return types. So if you just check for the parameter types, um, that might not be the best way to do it. But for now, it's good enough. We say var m. Uh, <laughs> so first we said the name, name equals name. Um, so this is the methods that we need. 
and then we can say now we have to resolve so for each of our method let's call this methods so if method parameters count is not parameter type names length continue then we have to say for uh, what is that parameter type names length if uh, boom, 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 method parameters I type name parameter type full name is not the same as parameter type names um, let's call this var found all uh, all parameter all parameters match uh, true and we say false break if not all parameters match return uh, continue otherwise we say uh, assembly definition import reference for the method and we return that Why does it not work? Uh, because that doesn't exist there, it's on the main module. Um, and then if we get here, that means we couldn't find it. So that means result report. Um, required method not found, which would be Type name, type name method, uh, I guess I should say method name, and then parameter type names, and then return not. Okay, so Let's do this. Console right line <coughs> reference is resolve method for system.console for the method called right line. And the parameter types, in our case, the only thing we care about is one, and that should be of type system dot string let's actually make sure that this works before we do anything further because there is a lot of code there is a lot of code so now we go here and same pattern here we basically say public void required method not found and then we emit something like that. Um, <clears throat> let's call this uh, parameter type name list. Parameter type names. The required method. method what is this thing um, method name so that would be type name method name 
and then uh, parameter <laughs> method, yeah, message. All right, so let's see how well we did. Well, not having a program crash is a step in the right direction. I agree. I very much agree. Uh, so nothing has changed here, but at least we also didn't crash. All right, so now that we have that, we should be able to do our thing. So let's start with load, load string, which is a, the way we load a little string and then we can just pass it here as a reference. We would say, hello world. Uh, and then we can basically just call the method emit opcodes call vert, I guess, but in our case we can actually say call um, and then the Method reference is our console right line reference. So let's see what happens when we do that. Oh my god, here it is. We load the string hello world, we call right line, we return. I know the test. Yay, we just emitted hello world. <clears throat> All right, so the thing is, one thing I mentioned earlier is that we cheated quite a bit. So let me, let me explain why we cheated quite a bit. So one of the problems that we have is, this is an XE, right? Axes are native uh, executables on the operating system. And the problem there is somebody needs to boot the runtime, right? We don't actually emit native code. What we're emitting here is IL, right? So this code here, somebody at some point has to emit actual machine code that makes this executable. And so on .NET Framework, we have a, a very interesting conundrum, which is the XE file here is actually fully managed. There is no native code in that guy. So when you launch a process with that path, who's actually loading the runtime? Who's responsible for loading the runtime? And the answer is the operating system. Because .NET Framework ships with Windows, there is effectively, a, if you will, a secret handshake between this thing and the .NET runtime. And so when we launch this thing, there is a part of the operating system that detects that we're launching a managed program that will then boot the runtime which will then JIT our entry point and everything that the entry point depends on effectively in order to execute it. On .NET Core, that doesn't work, right? On .NET Core, that's not how things are. There's no, like we're shipping this thing outside of Windows. So when you compile Hello World, let's actually go back to our, actually I can probably do another window here, right? Let's, let's go to our thing we did earlier when we went to, what was that, T Hello, I think. Right, so let's go to bin. Um, where are we here? Uh, debug, netcore app. So here's a few files you see in here. Let me actually, uh, what was that? Here we go, let's zoom in a lot. So what you have here is you have a few files in here. You have hello.dll, that is our actual hello world, right? So if we, if we actually decompile this guy, this is where our main method actually is, right? So this is where um, our program class is, uh, and this is where main is, right? But if we actually look closer here, there is an exe file, right? So what is that? Well, we can try to decompile that exe file but that won't work because this is actually not a managed exe. This is actually a native exe. So this thing here is effectively the same exe for any given .NET console app you can create. 
And all this thing does is it boots the .NET Core runtime. I mean, it finds the runtime on, on your machine. It boots up the runtime and then loads your actual entry point and then you know, starts jitting your entry point and executes that entry point, right? So in order for us to emit .NET Core, we basically have to create this exe file. Now, that is a lot of work potentially because I, originally I thought I can just copy the exe file, rename it, <laughs> but that's not how that works. Like if you actually, I actually go here. Yeah, I don't think you can see that necessarily, but uh, this thing here, actually we probably can. Uh, do I have this tool in the box? Let me. Um, bum, 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 bum. Yeah, I do not. Um, however, like you can, if you have tools that can decompile PE files, you can actually see that in this PE file here, there is a, actually no, I think we can see it here, right? Properties, details. Yes, here you can see it. Original file name. And this is the thing that is part of the, of, the, of the actual PE file. And that is the path that is actually being used. So unless I do some crazy gymnastics to do this, I can't easily replicate this. Um, there's this other thing that we could do though. If we delete all of this, um, well, let's start by just deleting the exe file. Right? Now what I can do is I can say don't, .NET exec hello.dll which basically uh, executes this thing. We could do that and I think what we need for this, let me actually uh, cheat a little bit. I think what you need is not the depths file not this one, but I think this runtime JSON file, that's what you need, yes. So if I start renaming this guy, then it will fail, right? So the actual, so the minimum thing we need to run a .NET Core app, you can also delete the symbols, is this. The hello.dll file and the JSON file. So we could do that as a first step, but that's also boring because ultimately we want an actual entry point, right? So long story short, the easiest way for me to do that, all of this, let me actually close this guy now, um, is by just literally having a project file. So let's do this here, right? So let's say in our hello thing, let's actually add uh, a new file. Let's call this hello.msproj. And what is msproj? Well, let's go to our Minsk CS proj here. Let's drop this guy in here. Uh, let's say this guy targets net core app 3.1. It doesn't reference anything, right? So this won't work as it is right now, right? Because, well, why would it, right? If you go here and we say uh, .NET build, uh, now it says a bunch of stuff like this. The create manifest names does not exist in the project, right? Um, the reason this happens is because we renamed the project file to msproj, right? So there's some built-in logic based on the extension of this thing, whether you invoke the VB compiler or the F-sharp compiler or the C-sharp compiler. And we renamed this to our thing, so nothing right now tells the system anything. So what we can do is, um, I actually have that prepared here somewhere. Uh, see users uh, videos. No, see D drive. Yeah, here we go. That's the one. Let me just copy and paste this stuff here. So there's a few things. So first thing is we will add this thing here. Let's actually add a property group. And let's indent this guy. Spaces for. 
Is that only, no, spaces two, right? Spaces, how many spaces do we have in our project files? Two, okay, so that's what I thought. Um, here we go. So basically what this does is a few things. So let's ignore, let's talk about this one here first. So that's basically saying, like if you remember from a C Sharp project file, we never listed our CS files. And the way the system discovers the CS files is by just using a wildcard inclusion of all CS files and all subdirectories from the folder where the project file is in, right? And what extension does it use? Well, this one, because we are in Minsk, so that's our extension we wanted to use. And then this is basically boilerplate. So this is basically the target that says what should happen when the compiler gets invoked. And in our case, we say, well, I want you to run our, our compiler, which is now here. So we say MS build this file directory, go up one. Actually, does that work? Uh, it goes up one, uh, goes down to, I guess, SRC in our case, right? And then MSC, MSC. So run this guy and then pass arguments. So what, what do we pass? Well, there's this thing called compile items. So MS build will already create compile items based on uh, our include here. And so we can say, okay, take all the compile items and I want you to produce a string out of them. And what I want you to do is I want you to uh, take the file name, the file path, which in MS build is called identity. And I want you to separate them with a space. Then the other thing I want you to do is I want you to pass in the intermediate assembly which is our output name uh, and then I want you to pass in, in our case we said references, so we said reference path and we basically said uh, uh, take all the references we have but only include the one where it's called system runtime so we don't pass in 100 modules. Uh, in fact, let's, uh, yeah, I guess that works. Doesn't matter really. And then we say, uh, okay, create, uh, create a string out of this, but prefix it with slash R because that's all references. And then again, separate them by a, with, a, with a space. So what happens now when I do .NET build? Assuming I got the paths right. The command exited with code one. Project file does not exist. Right? <laughs> what are you talking about? I'm standing on the project file. confused right now. The project file does not exist. What does that mean? So to, 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 to. Working directory is MS build project directory. That would be this one here, right? So how about this? How about instead of doing exec, let's comment all of this. And do What is happening? Why is this not, why is not everything commented? Do I not understand how commenting in the next and all works? <laughs> what is happening? <laughs> really? Really? Is that how that works? I think that's a bug in the highlighter. Message, uh, importance, 
hi text hello oh because I have uh, don't we hate this don't we hate this here we go All right, so could not copy file because it was not found. That's fine. So basically our compile task was executed, so we see it here, hello. Uh, but then because we didn't produce the actual file, um, bad things were happening, right? So let's actually take a look back what, uh, what ends up happening here is, um, so let's take, this and let's actually output this so this is the command line that we are generating so the command that we're generating is .NET run our compiler I see, yeah, the path we probably got wrong is this one here. That's probably the project file that didn't exist, right? So we go up one, then we are in samples. Yeah, we have to go up two. But here's the command that we pass to our compiler. We want to compile hello.ms. The output file is this guy here, which is our OBJ folder. And then things should actually work. So let's try this again. Um, Yep, exactly, I need to go up one more folder. All right, the command cannot be resolved among the given references. So here we go, the required type, system console, cannot be resolved among the given references. So I think first of all, our, um, our output here is pretty shitty. Which would be in the emitter, right? Dum, 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 dum. Um, bum, 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 bum. Yeah, we probably want invert conditional. So if it's now, then we output this, otherwise, we output that. Um, yeah, same here, right? If it is now, we output this, otherwise, we output that. All right, let's try this one more time. So, at least we get a, re a readable error message now, hopefully, from the compiler. So now we say the required type cannot be resolved among the given references. The required type system console cannot be resolved among the given references. So we're outputting this error message twice right now. Which is weird. Why is that? I mean, we go in here, we find all the things. If the, if the, we find it at least once, we do this. If we found it zero times, then we go here. And why would we output this twice?
It's written twice in right diagnostics. Maybe. Why would it be written twice though there? I mean, we filter first to everything that is text is null, and then we say everything is, well, the text is not null. So why would we do it twice? Oh, because we do right line diagnostics, which we copied from somewhere else, right? No? Oh yeah, we copied this one here. The diagnostic here is Ah, yeah, 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 I see, I see now. Okay, so let's do this. This should have fixed the problem. Good catch. Always good to have people on the stream that know what's going on. And now we have one error message, exactly, and it says we cannot find this guy. So why is that? Well, in .NET Core, the console type is not actually an MS callib or in system runtime. So let's change our thing here to not actually restrict it so let's copy this guy and say we actually want everything passed to the compiler. So give me all the reference paths. I don't know what just happened, but for some reason apparently I switched to a different to a different screen. <clears throat> All right, so here we are. So now we actually have written an exe, and so now when we say .NET run, unable to run your project. Ensure you have a runnable project type, and ensure .NET run supports this project. Interesting. So what did we mess up? I suspect what we messed up is, because this is a DLL now, it's probably going to be our module kind. So if we say, uh, bum, 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 where is it? Um, emitter here. We probably have to say module kind. DLL. Let's try this. Actually, no. It's actually not here at all. The problem is the project file. Because, of course, we have to set this to be an XE output type, right? So if we go to our um, for a compiler project here, we say output type is XE, right? So of course you have to do the same thing here because uh, that's how that works. What is happening? Why is my program hanging? Hmm. Just took a while, I guess, first run. Hmm. Maybe our compiler is really slow. I mean, that's also possible because we, I think one of the problems is that we pass a lot of references right now which we can also filter out if we wanted to. But, okay, so now we have this guy. So let's actually see what it would be, what would be produced. Bin debug, uh, netcrap 3.0, here we go. We have a hello.exe. So if we now say hello, here's our hello world. And if we now decompile it, um, then this is what we wrote, right? 
pretty nice. So now the only thing is we, of course, we don't want this garbage in the project file, right? So one easy hack that we can do, which will uh, make our project files appear pretty neat, is let's go in this folder here and let's add a few files. And namely directory, directory.build.props. Um, and we already have one, I believe. So this is what they look like, right? They are just regular project files. And basically the way these guys work is that they're automatically imported by every project in the subdirectories, right? So we can say targets. So we have these two guys now. And what we can do is we can just take the stuff that we don't like, namely this, we can put this here. And then we can take this, which are targets and put them here. And then of course I'm already up one directory because I just moved it here. So we can just remove one now here. And now we have a pretty clean looking project file. We have a pretty clean looking source file. So what we right now do here doesn't matter because we have a hard written compiler right now, but let's go to the, to the emitter and um, change our string, hello world from Minsk. So that we actually convince ourselves that that's actually what we, what we wrote. And now let's go up a few directories here and let's just say .NET run. I think this is the moment that we all waited for. So now we actually have an MS build project file uh, that is relatively clean. You know, we can, we can pass it to our compiler. And uh, on top of that, we have our, our thing. So now the only thing we have to do in the next episodes is actually emitting IL the right way instead of just writing some hardwired stuff on the command line. So we are slightly over time now, but I'm quite happy with the progress that we have achieved so far. So, uh, today is going to be apparently a single commit because <laughs> I didn't commit anything. Um, yeah, I will clean this up later. I think there's no point in you watching me committing a bunch of files. Um, but this is it. I think uh, let me just switch over to the outro. Yeah, so for today, I think we, we are in a good spot. Uh, next week, I will start writing actual IL for our language. And so we will probably walk top level down. Um, if I had to guess, it would probably take us two episodes to actually cover the entire language. We probably have to take some shortcuts. Uh, the reason being that some of the operators are quite involved because there's so many different operators that we have. And uh, so far we, we cheated a little bit uh, by using intrinsic functions already in .NET in order to do that. And then we wait later, but when we emit IL, we have to do a lot more work for those. So it will probably take us a few durations in order to cover them all. Same with statements, we have a bunch of statements. The nice thing is we have all lowered them already into a nice representation. So we don't have to deal with all different kinds of loops. We just have to deal with effectively go to and conditional branches at this point. Um, but still it will probably take us uh, a few uh, steps in order to get there. So um, if you guys have any more questions in chat, now is the time to ask them and I can, uh, I can cover them. Um, this is basically, I think, all we have for uh, what it takes to compile. I mean, there's different ways you can emit IL. Um, yeah, but I think the, the key thing is you need to kind of uh, think about how you lower stuff into the IL representation, right? And that kind of depends on the language that you have. In our case, it's a fairly simple language. But there's other languages where it's a bit more involved, right? For example, in C Sharp, when you think about async and other stuff, like there's no async, right? So you have to do some more heavy lifting to, for example, create a state machine for your, for your awaits and all of that other stuff. But the nice thing in our language is it kind of maps relatively nicely to IL at this point. Um, so the, the, the actual work for every single thing we need to do is very little, but we have a lot of those things. So it's not complicated, it's just uh, a lot of mechanical pieces that need to happen. Um, and then after we did IL, uh, the next thing after will be debuggability, right? Because right now it's cool that we can run things, 
But also it would be nice if we could actually debug our programs, right? And in the first episode, I actually showed what the debugger will look like. Um, debugging is actually not that hard either. Basically, the only thing we have to do is emit what's called sequence points in IL. So basically what you tell the debugger is, if you have this particular IL instruction, this corresponds to this region in the source code, right? And so then all the IL instructions that are between two sequence points are considered part of the same statement, if you will. And then the only trick on our side is to decide how many sequence points we have, when do we you know, have sequence points, you know, how do you want to do method calls, how do you want to do returns from methods, and all that stuff. But um, it's quite nice because once you have that, you can actually step through our program, which is, uh, which is quite nice. Awesome. Um, yeah, more unit tests would be nice. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, unit tests are always nice. I'm just really lazy at writing them, um, but we probably should do that. Sweet. All right, then uh, I say thanks to everybody who kept watching, and then uh, I hope I see you guys next week. Bye-bye.